caught, uncovered, shamed. All these words describe the woman caught in adultery as she was thrust out of the crowd and made to stand alone in the middle of a spiteful mob. Jesus, the light of the world, looked down at her. His light washed over her. His holiness stood in stark contrast to her sinfulness. He could have used the fact that he had the upper hand morally to expose her, but instead, he chose to set her free. That's what happens when we bring our sin into his light. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back to the scene. What she had done was paraded before the people. And what she would have given to be able to run away and hide, she would have given anything. The scribes and the Pharisees waited. Surely this time they had Jesus in an impossible situation. The woman's sin was indisputable. The consequence for it had already been laid out in scripture. Jesus would have to condone stoning her. And finally, the people's love for him would lessen. Picture with me the people standing around Jesus. All of them were wearing masks. The Pharisees and the scribes wore masks of self-righteousness. They wore their good works on the outside, trusting that their ability to check off the boxes of religious requirements made them acceptable to God. The woman wore a mask of shame. What had brought her to that point of giving her body away? What did she hope to receive in exchange for her gift of self? Not this. Her dignity was in shreds. She wore dishonor like a robe that masked any goodness within. Little did they know, Jesus' light was about to shine on all their hearts, revealing that they all had need of forgiveness. He was about to offer them all a better way to live. For the woman caught in adultery, he offered redemption. Instead of being caught, he offered her freedom. Instead of being exposed, he offered her authenticity. Instead of being shamed, he offered her dignity and forgiveness. For the scribes and Pharisees, he offered them a new way to see God. They understood God to be the authority, handing down rules to be obeyed. And Jesus offered them the invitation to know God as full of mercy encouraging virtuous living as a means to freedom, not a checklist to follow. Jesus offered them all a choice between slavery and freedom. They could choose between slavery to sin and slavery to self-righteousness or freedom in Christ's light. He offered truth, promising the truth will set you free. Let's dig deeper and take a look at what Scripture teaches us about slavery and freedom. Turn with me to John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Jesus then said to the disciples who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and we have never been in bondage to anyone. How is it that you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not continue in the house forever. The son continues forever. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free. Indeed. Why did the people feel they were already free? They based their freedom on their relationship to Abraham. But Jesus said that true spiritual freedom is only experienced by his disciples who remain in his word. So what does he mean by remain in his word? Well, this goes beyond just hearing his words, and it means that his words are applied in daily living. The virtues laid out in scripture and church teaching are seen in day-to-day life. So the scribes and the Pharisees knew the word of God. I mean, it was their job to copy it and to preach it. Yet they weren't applying the principles to their lives. 
and we can fall into the same habit, hearing scripture read at mass, but not living out the principles contained in them. Their response and ours has a lot to do with whether our relationship with God is more like a slave to a master or a father to a child. We read in John 1, 12, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. What this verse is talking about is this. If you do not receive Jesus, if you do not accept him, he cannot give you the ability to become a son or daughter of God. He cannot share the life he experiences with the Father with you. And you remain a slave. This is what happened to the Pharisees. They remained slaves rather than becoming children of God. Dr. Steve Grundman addresses this in a talk titled Competing Christian Visions of the Person. And he described two competing visions, calling one the counterfeit vision and the other the Christian vision. In the counterfeit vision, a woman's relationship with God is like that of a slave to a master. The concept of law, or put another way, God's instructions on how to live, is seen mainly as an external restraint. It's something outside of me, put on me, a restriction of my freedom. It's not seen as an aid to freedom or something that might help me grow. It is a moral theory focused on obligation and law. And the question asked by a person holding this view is, what do I have to do? Whatever the competent authority says I have to do makes up the moral life. The Christian view, rooted in the gospel, looks at the law and morals differently. It stems from a father-daughter relationship with God. In Crossing the Threshold of Hope, St. John Paul II wrote about how our paradigm needs to shift from master-slave to father-son. There are two very different questions to ask in the moral life. One is, what do I have to do? This is the question of a slave. What do I have to do? What am I required to do? The other question we can ask is, how can I be happy? We aren't to ask this in a selfish way, but it's a fair question. How can I be fulfilled? This is the question of a son or a daughter. What's the right way to do this, Dad? Tell me the right way to live. So we look at God's word, which is his instructions to us, in a completely different way when we approach him as a daughter and not as a slave. God's instructions to us can be seen as signs on a hiking trail. There are warnings that say disaster ahead and scenic overlook. And they are guidelines from a loving father. They are a light shining in darkness. They are the way in which he leads us to a fulfilling life. And we see this laid out in Romans 8, 14 through 17. It says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. These passages have everything to do with relationship. In this relationship, God promises freedom to those who follow him. He contrasts the life of a slave who must obey and a family member who is invited to obey. God issues us an invitation to follow him, and he promises that freedom will follow. Jesus offered this invitation of a better life to the woman caught in adultery when he said, Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. He knew that she would experience true freedom when she began to grow in virtue. Far from being what would constrain her or limit her or repress her, following Jesus, the joy of virtue, would lead her to a life of freedom and joy. In the words of Dr. Grundman, virtue is essential to freedom. Virtue is precisely how freedom grows. 
It's developing that interior strength which enables us to do something new that we were not able to do before. It's so easy to reduce the spiritual life to a list of things that I should do. How much better is the life of freedom to ask God, Dad, what is the best way for me to be fulfilled and happy? He wants you to experience a life of freedom. His desire is that you would experience it in your past, present, and future. So let's take a look at how we can apply these principles to each of those seasons of our lives. How we can experience freedom from the pain of the past, the pressure of the present, and the fear of the future. So most of us have pain from our past, and perhaps it has come from a circumstance in our lives that we feel God could have prevented. Some of our pain is the result of our own mistakes. Hope and vitality can be sapped when we realize that we have failed in relation to a crucial relationship or responsibility, or fallen again and again. And this can leave us consumed by debilitating regret. To break free from this pain, we need to stand on the firm foundation of faith. To walk by faith, we need to stand on truth, not rely on our emotions. And two important truths to dwell on are these. God is all good, and God is all powerful. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves of these truths, and other times the doubts get so strong that we question whether or not He is all good and all powerful. And when this happens, we need to take the time to feed the truth instead of feeding the doubt. When we dwell on the doubts, we just remain in a dark place. And we can choose to dwell on the truth by reading scripture and solid spiritual writing with the intention of growing in our understanding of God's character. Author Linda Dillow asks, Am I going to judge God by circumstances I can't understand? Or judge the circumstances in the light of the character of God? This is a great question for self-reflection, but it is only effective if we put in the time to know and understand the character of God. We will never fully understand Him. Our minds are incapable of being wrapped around God. He is beyond our capabilities of understanding. But we can grow in understanding. He does shed light on who He is to those who are willing to put in the time and the work of humble learning. When we have pain from our past, we want it removed. And many of us have asked God to do this for us. And sometimes He does. Another way that God brings healing is to perform healing gradually, allowing us to participate in the process. It's difficult to do, but we help the healing process when we pray that our pain would be redeemed. We can ask God to teach us everything He has for us in this painful circumstance, past or present. We can ask Him to use every tear and every tearing away for something good. William Barclay wrote, Endurance is not just the ability to bear a hard thing, but to turn it into glory. Can you do that? Can you ask God to turn your pain into glory? Forgiveness is sure to be a part of that process. And it may be forgiving someone who has hurt you, or it may mean forgiving yourself. Forgiveness can coexist with a lot of emotional pain, resentment, and anger. But these emotions will gradually diminish through the power of prayer. In the words of author, pastor, and sexual abuse survivor Dan Allender, You have been damaged, but you have great hope. The mercy of God does not eradicate the damage, at least not in this life, but it soothes the soul and draws it forward to a hope that purifies and sets free. Allow the pain of the past and the travail of the change process to create fresh new life in you and to serve as a bridge over which another victim may walk from death to life. And Linda Dillow wisely wrote, If we could fully comprehend God, He wouldn't be God. He'd be like us. But God is not like us. He is far more powerful and far more good than we are. We may feel like we are walking in the dark. If so, the safest way to go forward is by holding His hand. 
We want to be free from the pain of the past and also free from the pressure of the present. Many of us feel pressure that comes from people-pleasing. This is addressed in Galatians 1.10 when St. Paul said, Am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. And then Hebrews 12.1 tells us to run the race set before us with perseverance. And it's hard to do this if our eyes are always looking to the side to see what people think of us. Imagine doing that in an actual race where you were required to jump over hurdles on the way to the finish line. If you kept looking at the people on either side of you, you'd wipe out. And it's the same in our day-to-day lives. In the race God asks us to run, we face hurdles all the time. I need to fix my eyes on what God has asked of me. You need to fix your eyes on what God has asked of you. And we can encourage each other in our races. But people-pleasing, comparison, and competition will only leave us down for the count. As we run our race, we don't only face hurdles. We carry burdens along the way, and that makes it hard to keep moving forward. It's worth examining the burdens that we are carrying and prayerfully ask, are these burdens that God has asked me to carry? Often we feel obligated to meet the needs and desires of those around us, and the result is an impossible load to carry. We have only enough time in the day to do the things that God has called us to. If we carry loads that others have handed us and don't check if they are God's will for us, we will feel the pressure of busyness. God cares what we do with our time, and He wants us to experience His rest. We can only do that if we abide in Him and take the time to discern His will for the way that we spend our time. We read of this in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 13. It says, According to the commission of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and another man is building upon it. Let each man take care how he builds upon it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Just like St. Paul, You have been given a commission. This is the race you have been asked to run. So it's worth asking yourself if you are building a foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, or with wood, hay, and straw. The gold, silver, and precious stones represent activities that have lasting value. But the wood, the hay, and the straw represent things that might seem important in the short term, but in the end of your life, they will be burned up. 1 Corinthians three fourteen and 15 goes on to say, If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. We are wise to ask the question, Why am I doing what I am doing? What is my motive? Is it to please people? Is it to accomplish my personal goals? Is it because it's what I feel like doing? We have a tendency to do good things in order to not feel guilty about doing the things we're really supposed to be doing that aren't appealing to us. God cares about what we do with our time and why we do it. Oftentimes, when we feel overwhelmed, we are tempted to, to immediately quit our activities. But how much better it is when we analyze which ones are the ones God is calling us to. In the words of Oswald Chambers, God says, I will stay you, not I will put you to bed and hold your hand and sing you to sleep, but I will get you out of bed, out of the languor and exhaustion out of the state of being half dead while you were alive. I will imbue you with the spirit of life and you will be stayed, you'll be sustained by the perfection of vital activity. God wants us to be free of the pain of the past, 
the pressure of the present, and the fear of the future. Jesus' first words to the disciples after he rose from the dead were, do not be afraid. But it's undeniable that scary things happen. We look at the world and we see things that are deeply concerning. We look at our own lives and the lives of those we love and are so aware of how vulnerable we are, of just how much could go wrong. What are we to do with genuine fears of what might be around the corner? God doesn't want us to be afraid, and he promises the strength and the grace to get us through even the most difficult circumstances. But he doesn't promise that he'll give us grace to worry. So often we expend an exorbitant amount of energy dwelling on what might be, and more often than not, the worst case scenario that plays in our heads never comes to pass. When worry begins to take over our hearts, we're wise to consider it a call to prayer. It can be the very thing that draws us to God. As we turn our hearts to Him, we are reminded of St. John's words in 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. When our anxieties spin out of control, we have shifted our focus from God's love for us and the fact that He is always in control and we placed our focus onto our circumstances or the things we fear might happen. We start to focus on how out of control we feel, and we forget that we aren't supposed to be the ones in control. God is. Dwelling on God's unconditional love helps to remind us that He is continuously at work in our lives, loving us as precious daughters. He didn't create the world and then turn away, leaving us to our own devices. He has remained involved in the details of our lives. Instead of dwelling on our emotions, we need to dwell on God's truth. And the truth is, He loves you. He is crazy about you. Your life is in His hands. There is not a single thing you are worried about that has slipped His notice. He is already in the future, working things for good. But He asks that we trust Him in the midst of the feelings of uncertainty. When we fear the future, we can also ask God to search our hearts to help us see if the anxiety is coming from a determination to get our own way. There is a subtle difference between needs and wants. Philippians 4.19 promises that God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Whatever we need, not whatever we want. And God often knows what we need better than we do. Remember that God wants us to be fulfilled, and He knows that true fulfillment comes from becoming more like Jesus. Sometimes that involves pain. Can we trust His love? Can we trust that He'll only allow that which is best for us in the long run? Our answer to this has a lot to do with our perspective on life. Is it eternal? Are our eyes on the quality of our eternity or on the quality of our time on earth? When we are in the midst of difficult circumstances and we fear that there may be worse things around the corner, one key to peace can be found in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, Have no anxiety at all, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are to pray with thanksgiving. What can we thank God for when we don't like where we are and where we might be heading? We can thank Him that He listens, that He loves us unconditionally, that He understands our hurt, that He has the power to redeem even the most horrible circumstances, that He is at work, even if it is hidden from our view, that He has never forgotten us or forsaken us. The same invitation offered to the adulterous woman and the Jewish people is offered to us. We are invited to step into Christ's light and see God as our loving Father and His instructions as our guide to fulfillment. And with Him, we can let go of the pain of the past, receive help with the pressure of the present, and find release from the fear of the future. God says to each one of us in Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, 
for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the light of your word, for the light that comes when we switch our focus away from our emotions, away from our circumstances, and onto who you are. Help us to see you not as our master and ourselves as a slave, but as you as our Father and us as your beloved daughters. Help us to see the instructions that you give us as the key to our freedom, the key to our fulfillment, rather than a way in which our fun is going to be spoiled. I pray that we would develop an internal perspective that allows us to be free of the pain of the past, of the pressure of the present, and of the fear of the future. May we cling to your promises, and may we each and every day begin it with a spirit of gratitude, thanking you for all the things that you give us, regardless of the things that we have that we don't want, or the things that we don't have that we wish we did. Help us to see your goodness, help us to see your power, and help us to see your love each and every day. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.